Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to talk about this thing called life. Some of you are not sure if that's scripture or prince. <laughs> it's prince. <laughs> you know, um, when I used to go to church and the pastor referred to people as beloved, you ever heard that? Beloved brethren, it used to kind of creep me out. You know, I was just like, well, you don't know me, I'm beloved. Who talks like that? You know, but as I prepare for this message, I've been kind of overwhelmed in many ways, just the power of the love of God. And I'm not talking about like 1970s smiley face bumper sticker kind of God is love, love. I'm talking about the depth and the breadth and the meat and the power of the love of the living God. And really, and how the more we understand that, how it relates to our capacity to trust him with our lives. Now, I don't know about you, but trust is hard to come by for me. I, I struggle with it. It's, uh, my mom raised me to be like hyper independent, you know, and so I just, I don't trust people easily. I don't trust them readily. It took a long time for me to learn how to do that, like, like all kinds of counseling and all kinds of stuff, you know, to figure out how to trust people. And my wife, aside from my mother, my wife was one of the first people I ever really learned how to trust, you know. One of the things I trusted was that she was pretty hot, trusted that. That was good. So that was the first step. And then, and then one of the things is, is she accepted me, you know, and, and somebody who loves you and accepts you for who you are. Her character, I trusted. She's this, like, woman whose relationship with God was independent of me. She was pursuing him on her own. I figured, well, if I'm going to trust anybody, it's going to be at least somebody who has got that going on. And the more she learned to love me and accept me, not just for who I was and all my goofiness and all my foibles and strengths, but also who I was going to become. I started to learn how to trust her even more readily. You know, when you trust somebody, it makes you vulnerable, right? I mean, it gives them power over you. It gives them the capacity to, to even hurt you. But yet it's so important in relationship to figure out how to have trust. Now, the big idea for this series has been this. The key to having consistent peace is to stay in constant contact with God through prayer. That's your very first fill-in. So get ready. Okay? The key to having consistent peace is to stay in constant contact with God through prayer. Now, the thing that I'm reluctant to say about this idea is this is a series on prayer. Is it? Yeah. Okay, yeah. We want to we improve our prayer lives. But as soon as we say that, it's like you open up this little compartment over here that says, okay, here's my prayer life. I really need to work on my prayer life. And you kind of you work on that and you think you're going to massage it. And then you close that drawer and you walk away. But see, constant contact is not about our prayer life so much as our relationship with God, our cognizance of who he is, his presence in our lives, how we walk with him and relate to him every hour of every day. It's not just being on your knees 24-7. That's not the point. It is walking with him in relationship with him. That's what constant contact is about. Our first week of the series, we did this. We talk about constantly asking God for what you need. Constant asking God for what you need. He doesn't tire of hearing from you. He doesn't get weary of you. And unlike maybe your spouse or your kids, they may get tired of hearing your voice, but God is always ready to hear from you. He loves that. Constantly thanking God for his provision. As we walk in a state of gratitude for his presence in our lives, that awareness of our relationship with him just brings out nothing but gratitude in us. And today, we're going to talk about constantly trusting God to work. Now, this one is a little tough. Thanks, Dan. He gave me the hard one. Constantly trusting God to work. Now, that's a challenge for a lot of us. It's like placing your trust in God, and it's this ethereal, nebulous thing. We want to un unpack that a little bit here today. So here's our key scripture for the whole series from Philippians chapter 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Don't you love that? The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That peace that transcends understanding, you know what he's saying? He's saying people are going to look at you like you're crazy. They're not going to understand this thing that transcends human understanding. How can you trust God? How can you have such hope? How can you have such peace in light of your circumstances? Then he's saying, the Lord is near. Rejoice. Don't be anxious. He is close. And that is what brings you the peace as we place our faith and our trust in him. The big idea for this week is this. God can be trusted because through Jesus, 
We are completely accepted and loved. God can be trusted because through Jesus we are completely accepted and loved. And to know trust isn't easy for many of us. A lot of us have got a lot of baggage in that regard. And even just this idea of this God, this out there, you know, kind of thing that you want to somehow place your faith in is a challenge for a lot of us. But I want to give you three main reasons. There's dozens and dozens of reasons why we can trust our God. But I'm going to give you three things. I'm going to take you on a little bit of sort of a roundabout journey here today. Okay, the first one is this. We trust God's character beyond our capacity to understand him. We trust in his character beyond our human capacity to understand him. Okay, there's a little illustration I want to use for you, and it's, it's been around for a long time. It's called the cosmic box. Now, the box is this. The box is everything that is material. It's all time, space, and matter, right? And every religious or, or religious or philosophical worldview, we think of all, of all of the universe as in the box, okay? It's all matter, time, and space. It's everything. It's you and I. It's the stars, the cosmos. It's gravity. It's all of those things are in the box, okay? And the assumption here in every single worldview is this. First of all, that you and I, okay? I'm going to show you some really spectacular art here today. You and I reside in the box, in the box of creation. But here's another reception from every other worldview. It says this, that if you believe in some kind of a God, some kind of deity, whether maybe it's just the force, right? But it's that that deity also resides in the box. And that's the basic assumption of every worldview. Now, here's, here's what's interesting. The God of the Bible is different The God of the Bible is unique in all the worldviews and all of history in that the God of the Bible resides outside of the box. See, this is called the transcendent view of God. He is, he's the one who made the box. He's not contained by it. He's not limited by it. He transcends the box. And at the same time, he is also present in the box. He is also imminent. He is also close. He is with us. He's not limited by it. He's within it, and yet at the same time, he created it. And is it safe to say this God might know something you and I don't know? The God of the Bible. Here's another unique thing. Okay, you and I travel through time like this, okay? Unless you've got a a DeLorean and a flux capacitor, we're pretty much stuck going one direction through time, okay? We can go forward. We can't go backward. We're like this. But the God of the Bible interacts with time in a different way, right? Because he made it. He created it. I want to read something to you from the book of Exodus, chapter 3. It says this. "Is Moses is up on Mount Sinai, right? He's he's talking to the burning bush, the presence of God in the bush. He's got the Ten Commandments, and he's going to go down the mountain, and he's going to talk to Israel, then he's going to go to Egypt, and in Egypt he's going to say, okay, let my people go. We know the whole story. But this this is the interaction Moses has with God. I love this. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you to them. I am. Now, if you're talking about a being, all right, who, who made time, who interacts with it however he wants, he is both, he can go backwards, he can go forwards, he is present in all of time, all the time. What? What? He's present in time all the time. See, he doesn't have to travel through it like you and I. He is in it, okay? What other name do you have for him except for, uh, okay, I am. This is the God who is. He is before, he is with, he is in front of us. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is the God of the Bible. He is transcendent. He is not limited. He's not contained. He goes beyond our comprehension. He has a perspective that you and I can't possibly have. Does that make sense? Today I'm going to preach, okay? You got to talk back. (laughs) Somebody throw out an amen. Amen. Yes. (laughs) I always wanted one of those. This God is not limited. He knows something that you and I don't know. He sees all of it all the time. He is aware of your thoughts, your motives, your actions long before you ever will. He is present in all of it, and he's not limited by it. This is the God that we worship. It's not a God that we can get our heads around. It's a God that we can't comprehend. It's not a God that we can make in our own image. He doesn't fit in the box. He made the box. 
This is who we worship. This is the God of the Bible, and this is what makes him unique amongst all the worldviews and philosophies in history. Now, okay, the other day I'm sitting in the living room, and my son is in the kitchen, and he's playing a game on the computer or something, and he says, he's, I start hearing like him moaning, and I'm going, okay, I thought the video game was going bad on him, and he was mad about it. I look in there, he's doubled over the chair. I'm like, and he's like, oh, I'm like, buddy, what's going on? I go in there, he looks up at me, and his lips are white. I go, what's wrong? My tummy hurts. Oh, and they're like, are you going to throw up? I don't know, which is secret dad code for get to the bathroom now. So we go in the bathroom, and he's just this little skinny little dude, you know, and I got him in front of me, and he's in front of the toilet like, like the big porcelain bus driver, and he's in there, and he's like going, oh, oh, and then suddenly he starts going, oh, Lord, no, <laughs> Lord, Lord, oh, no, Lord, why, 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 and I'm... I'm very conflicted at this point in time because I feel like the bad dad. Part of me is really proud of him because he's crying out to God. And the other part of me is desperately trying not to laugh. Because <laughs> he's this little frail little buddy. Why? Why? Oh, God, no, no. And then he, the thing happens, and then he gets up like nothing happened, and he's fine. <laughs> now, as I'm sitting there, and I'm holding his little body, and I'm trying not to laugh because I'm not, I'm not that concerned because I know some things that he doesn't know. He's probably ate something bad. He got a little touch of the flu, you know, the, the drama. I can't imagine drama in our house, but he, he, you know, it's probably not, not all that necessary. He's going to be okay. I understand that. I know that. And how normal is it for you and I, in light of life circumstances, to go, why? Why, God? Why? How can this happen? How can you allow these things to occur? Why am I sick? Why did I lose the job? Why did the thing happen? And the only thing we can go back to is, I don't understand, God. I don't understand. But I got to trust your character beyond my ability to comprehend you, to, to, to understand your motives and your character. You are holy. You are just. You are always loving. You are always present. You are always with me. You always want my best. And yet you have a perspective that I can't possibly understand and you're asking me to trust you despite what I see despite my circumstances despite how I feel he's saying I am with you I'm behind you and it's gonna be okay this is the God we worship and we trust in his character as opposed to questioning his motives all the time that's our first step towards trust and I tell you what, it, it's, it's not easy. It's a challenge. And very often, I have, okay, have you ever had this experience if you're a parent? You're doing something, you turn around, you're at the bottom of the stairs, you turn around, and you just see this like, wow, this kid coming at you through the air, right? And he just, he just goes for it, complete, full body, just throw himself into the air. And he knows you can do everything that you can do to keep his oversized noggin from hitting the ground. I'm going to kill myself to get, keep that kid from hurting himself because he just trusts me completely. He knows I'm going to go for it. He knows I love him. He knows I'm there for him. And God is saying this of you and I. My children, trust me. I am for you. The God of the universe who is beyond our comprehension, more powerful than you and I can possibly imagine, the most dangerous being in all of the creation and outside of creation, and at the same time, he is wholly good and wholly loving. And he is present, and he loves you and I. And he's asking us to trust him like a child. Jesus says it like this. In Luke chapter 18, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. It's our faith. It's that act of trust. What is that? What is faith, right? It's the evidence of things unseen, the substance of things hoped for. And according to Scripture, it is impossible to please God without it. And he's saying, come to me like this child, full body, whole bore, all the way, completely trusting because you know I'm there and you know I'm going to catch you. He's not going to back off. And he says, you got to be, uh, we're modern, enlightened individuals, you know? Doesn't that kind of make it harder sometimes? We're so intelligent, you know, we're so educated. And he's saying, yes, your faith is intelligent. Yes, it is rational. Yes, it is a reasonable faith. And I am convinced of this. Anybody who's willing to be an honest thinker, 
your thought is going to lead you to the cross. And it will confront you with the reality of who Jesus said he was and what he did. And you'll have to make a choice there. Our faith is intelligent, but it is still faith. And he still requires it. And he said, come to me like this little child, completely trusting, loving. That child doesn't understand you. He doesn't understand your perspective. He can, you know, he, he's five years old. He doesn't, he, you say you're 45 years old. He's like, wow, <laughs> that's like forever, you know, and you're going, I'm, I'm just a kid myself. They, we don't understand. We come to him as a child. We can't understand his perspective. Are you kidding me? But it still requires faith of you and I. We trust God because he is the father who always wants the best for us. We trust him because he's the father who always wants the best for us. A couple of weeks ago, in just the verses very previous to what I'm going to read you right now, Pastor Dan unpacked this idea of constantly asking God for what we want because he doesn't tire of you and I. He doesn't tire of hearing from us, and he knows you're going to ask for things, and he wants us to ask for things. But then Jesus follows it up with this. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Circle good gifts both of those times. The Heavenly Father gives good gifts to those who ask him. Now, if there's a family that lives on your street, i got a family that lives on our street right here. Hi. This illustration is not about you, okay? Just so you know. <laughs> Don't feel picked on. Um, if you've got a family down the street, and you know they give their kids everything they ask for, all right? Clearly not you, okay. <laughs> so now i got to live next to these people, okay? And, and he said, you know, the kids, they always ask, all they want to eat is ice cream and candy and cake, and by the way, I want you to buy me a gun, okay? And, and their parents do it for them. Would we consider that good parenting? Was that a good gift? Okay, now they may have asked for ice cream, candy, and cake at every meal, and you go, you know, that's yeah, probably not a good idea. Maybe every once in a while, that's okay. Or maybe we'll, instead of a real gun, okay, how about, because you'll shoot your brother, and that, this will happen in my house, um, how about instead of a gun, we'll get you a Wii, and you can shoot at, you know, spacecraft or something like that, okay? How, how about that, okay? The, the Heavenly Father wants to give good gifts to those of us who ask Him. And we don't always understand that. We ask Him for something, we don't always get the perspective, but have you ever been to your 20-year reunion? Remember that guy, that girl? I just want them to love me. Oh, love me. Oh, God, please, if only he will love me, then I'll be complete. And then you see him 20 years later, and you're like, okay. <laughs> like you dodged that bullet. Thank you, God, <laughs> for unanswered prayer. And it doesn't mean that there necessarily has to be something wrong with them. Maybe God is just preparing you for something else. Maybe it's just something that's different. When I was in my 20s, there was this, uh, it was a rough season for me, but there was this, this girl that I had a crush on, and, um, and so, I, you know, she seemed nice and everything, so I asked her out, and she said yes, which was, you know, a good first step. Um, and so we went on a date, and I dressed up, and, you know, she was there, and I picked her up, you know, in my, my sweet little roller skate Suzuki Samurai with the soft top that leaked in the rain, and... Uh, I took her to this restaurant. We had this great conversation. It was like so much chemistry. The Olive Garden has never seen such a conversation. <laughs> and every time I had ever had that kind of interact and, uh, interaction with a girl, it had always like there had always at least advanced somehow. It had gone on to some kind of next step. It had become a little bit more than just that initial day. And so we got to the end of that date. It was a really great time, at least, you know, with the litmus test I had of my relationships in the past. And I, you know, I said, hey, let's do this again. She's like, oh, sure, that'd be great. And then long story short, she blew me off completely. And in my mind, I'm rationalizing. She's just threatened by her love for me or... <laughs> She doesn't think she's good enough for me or something horrifying, I'm sure I was thinking. And uh, I ended up going after her, and, and she was, I was showing up places where she was going to be. I was, I'm sure it was creepy and kind of like a stalker. Um, <laughs> and it just nothing was working, and I am not the kind of guy to give up. You know, I'm persistent because all, don't all the movies say you got to persist? you got to go after it. So I'm going after it. Eventually, I got the bright idea to buy her flowers. Now, I didn't just get her the platonic, unintimidating yellow roses. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, I got her the enormous, splayed-out alien spacecraft arrangement of flowers, and I sent it to her home where she lives with her sister and her parents, okay? Now, at, girls, have you ever gotten flowers from somebody you just really didn't want to get flowers from? You're like, 
Oh, hey. <laughs> Times 10, man. Okay? And I just, she didn't respond. She didn't answer that. And I just kept going, why? It just seems so obvious. I'm a good guy. I'm not a bad guy. It should happen. And there wasn't anything wrong with her. She wasn't, you know, going to be horrifying 20 years later on. But here's what I know. God had something else for me. He had something better for me. He knew the smoking hot honey I was going to meet a few years later. <laughs> and Gwen and I have talked about this. That if we had met just a few years earlier, it would have been bad. One, I didn't have the emotional maturity to handle a real relationship. And two, she wouldn't have been willing to cut loose the five guys she was stringing along. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You could talk back on that. Yeah. So a little time was a real win-win, okay, for both of us. I rather enjoyed that. Sometimes when we ask God for something, he's got three answers for us. It's either yes, no, or wait. And the hard thing for us is to determine the difference between no and wait. And only time will tell you. But he's saying, I am your heavenly father. I know things you don't know, and I am for you. I want to give you good gifts, things that are for your benefit, things for your future, things to prosper you. And you've got to trust me that sometimes the thing you're asking for, even though it looks like a good thing, maybe ain't the best. Maybe it's not what you need right now. Ask yourself the question is, you know, when somebody, you have an interaction in your family, a conflict in your family, do you just give somebody what they want, or do you give them what they need? What is the most loving thing you can do? And our ultimately, holy, completely loving Father is saying, I know, I'm with you. I love you, and I hear you. Maybe I got something else. Maybe you're just going to need to wait just a little while. Some of you, this idea of looking at God as a heavenly Father is really difficult, because your earthly parents... We're lousy. Maybe you were betrayed, rejected, hurt, wounded by your parents. And so trying to look at it, God as a heavenly father is just like, oh, it's a, that's a very difficult connect. You so desperately want the approval of, of your, your parents, and you're not going to get it. And I want to tell you this. You have a heavenly father that looks on you with pleasure. He looks on you with love. Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus for your salvation? He looks at you, he doesn't see your rebellion. He doesn't see your mistakes. He doesn't see the lousy choices you've made. He sees you through the sacrifice of his son. And he says, your sin is as far as the east is from the west. That is a long, long way. And the God of the universe looks on you with pleasure and says, have you seen my boy? Oh, I'm so proud of him. Have you seen my girl? She's so beautiful. If God had a wallet, your picture would be in it. He'd bust that out, be a, and you'd see all these pictures of you on it. If God had a smartphone, your goofy mug would be on his desktop. He knows you and he loves you. And scripture says in Zephaniah that he dances over you. He celebrates over you with approval. You have his love. You have his approval. You don't have to earn it. You just have it. He is for you, and he is present with you, and he's saying, you can trust me. The God of the universe wants nothing more than to be in constant contact with you and I. The God who made it all, the God with the perspective we can't possibly grasp, has manifested himself in the person of Jesus, the whole glory of the living God through Jesus Christ, because he wanted to be in relationship with you and I, so he paid the price for sin you and I could never pay so that we could know him. And he would live within you and I and be present with you all the time in constant contact with you and I all the time. That was his heart's desire. He wants good gifts for you and I. And the next point is this. We trust God because his love is unconditional and unrelenting. It is unconditional and unrelenting. This good God who wants good gifts for you and I says this in Romans chapter 8. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? 
who he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will we not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then can condemn? No one. That is why we trust him. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Jesus is talking behind your back. And he's saying, have you seen my boy? Have you seen my girl? Oh, you ever had that feeling about your own kids? Oh, I love them so much. You show everybody their pictures and they're like, yeah, that's a kid. And you're going, oh. And Jesus is looking behind your back and said, you're doing better than you think you are. I am for you. I am interceding with you to with the Father. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. This was written to the Roman church. These people were dying. They were being killed. They were being martyred for their faith. And you and I, we have our troubles. We have our trials. We have our light and momentary issues. But he's saying this to you and I. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is why we trust him. Can I get an amen? Amen. The God of the universe has expressed himself completely in Jesus to pay the price we could never pay. He created a perfect heaven with a perfect future and sin entered the universe and corrupted it and he said they could never do it so I'm going to do it for them. That's the God that we know. You know what else is unique about Christianity? You know what else is unique about the God of the Bible? Every other religious system, every other philosophy says you might get to be okay with God. If you work hard enough, if you're good enough, if you sacrifice yourself, you just might make it but you can never be sure Because God is fickle and God is distant and he just kind of is okay with you, maybe. And Jesus said, you can know that you're okay. I've written these things that you might know that you have eternal life. You can be confident because he paid the price. He sealed the deal. He's offering this gift to us that we could never earn. For by grace you have been saved, not of works. It is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. You and I can't earn it. So we can't be proud about it, but I can be proud of his work in me. This is the God we worship, the God who made it all, whose perspective you and I can't possibly grasp. And he's asking us to trust him, the God who is a perfect father, who wants perfect gifts for you and I, who sees things we can't see and desires the best for us. And that same God who says, nothing can separate you from my love. No college professor, no government, no religious system, No parent, no baggage, no hurt, no sin, no rebellion can separate you from my love. This is the God of the Bible. This is the God we worship. This is the God who is worthy of our trust, who's worthy of constant contact with you and I. This is what he desires for us more than anything else. And he's asking you to trust him. Some of you have been going to church for a long, long time. And you've been processing this stuff for a long, long time. And you've nodded your head. You've given intellectual assent to these ideas. And church is good. And my kids need a good moral fiber and values and grounding and all that. But you've never trusted him. You believe. Well, Scripture says the demons believe and they shudder. But have you placed your trust in him? And you've been processing this maybe for days, weeks, months, years. I don't want to tell you today is the day to put your trust in him. To put that marker in the ground, to build that altar and say, today is the day I stepped over the line. When Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who will open that door, I will enter in and I will eat with him. He wants to be in fellowship with you. He wants to be in constant contact with you. He doesn't want to be outside here. You just kind of sort of are aware of his existence. He wants to be with you. And he did everything he could do to be with you and I. So in a moment, we're going to pray. 
And I'm going to ask those of you here who you feel God knocking at the door of your heart right now to pray these words with me. For the first time, to take that step towards putting your faith and trust in Jesus to secure your relationship with God, to do the work that you could never do. Everyone, would you bow your heads and close your eyes, please? And somehow the love of God is, is penetrated, your intellect penetrated your heart. And for those of you who want to make that prayer, I want you to pray this in your hearts today. It's not about the specific words I'm saying, but it's about your step here of faith in Jesus. So everyone, all the eyes closed, heads bowed here in the room. And pray this silently with me. God, I come to you. And I want to put my trust in you. I want to accept your invitation, Lord. And I've been processing this maybe for a long time, and I want to go ahead and I want to put my marker down today to say this is the day I took that step. I don't claim to understand all of it. I don't claim to understand you. I still have questions. But I'm trusting you today by faith for my salvation to restore me into relationship with you, God. I want to start new today. Now, everyone, please keep your eyes closed and your heads bowed. I want everyone in the room who prayed that prayer with me, just go ahead and look up. Let me see your eyes. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Here's what I want you to do. In the bulletin, there's that connect card. I want you to tear that off. And I want you to write on it, trusting for the first time. Put your contact info down there because we would love to, love to follow up with you and just let you know what the next steps are in your journey with God. And in a moment, we're going to celebrate as a community. Everyone who has their faith and trust in Jesus can come forward and celebrate communion. And this could be the first communion that you celebrate in a trusting relationship with God. And you bring that card forward and you put it in the basket and you take the elements to celebrate what Jesus has done. And all of us in the room here who are Christ followers will come forward and we'll take these elements. We have the bread that represents the broken body of Jesus. And we have the juice that represents the blood spilled out for the remission of sin. And we take these elements and you can just take them right here and then head back to your seat. As we celebrate how God built the bridge for us through Jesus. And some of you come ready happily to bring your Thanksgiving offering, to bring your harvest offering here today. And we don't do this because we're trying to score points with God. We don't do this because we're trying to get into a relationship with him. We do it because we're in a relationship with God. So you bring that offering joyfully before him today. Now everyone look up, please. What we're doing here is out of the abundance of God's presence in our lives, the overflow of our relationship with him as we celebrate communion and we bring our offerings to him. So I'm going to ask everyone to stand, please. And we're going to continue on here in worship in a few moments. Those of you who made that faith decision, that trust statement today, come and bring that card and drop it in there. Celebrate communion for the first time. And then we'll return back to your seats in these few moments here while we worship together.